today as we've gathered under that umbrella of the grace of God, we can truly say His grace is amazing. It is by grace that we find ourselves on this campus. It is by grace that we have the technology to reach out to the entirety of the world. For those of you that are on campus, thank you so much for being here. And if you are a guest or a visitor, I can most assuredly with confidence say that you are not only Not the only guest or visitor, but I have met dozens of people today who have been here for the very first time. And we want to thank you for being a part of us. And at the end of the service, we have a guest reception. We'd love to give you a token of gratitude for being here, but we'd also just love to hear where you came from, your name, just to meet you face to face. For those of you that are listening on 97.7 FM live or watching online or on television, thank you again for the privilege of allowing us to worship alongside of you. Let me reemphasize today, you're not watching, you're not listening, you are worshiping with us. Speaking of worshiping with us, what better way uh, to enter into a time uh, of praise together than what we know as the ordinance of baptism. Now, at the 945 hour, we had the privilege of baptizing four individuals. And at the 11 o'clock hour today, we have the opportunity to see four individuals baptized. So at this time, I'm going to turn over to my good friend and yours, Mr. Paul Dunbar. You didn't have to call me twice today, so that's always a good thing. How we doing, church? A little, 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 little sluggish this morning, okay? I get it. You won't be after the sermon today, but we are excited. We have four more baptisms during the 11 o'clock hour, three children and a father, which excites me as a dad to see fathers following in obedience and all three of them understand that this water is just nice warm water and it is their proclamation declaring Jesus as their king and lord of their life they have all made professions of faith we're going to start with my good friend miss lily collins rose she's very serious but they're going to want to see you smile there it is this is miss lily collins she's a second grader LC, has there been a time in your life when you've asked Jesus Christ to save you from your sins? Yes, All right. Turn this way. Take a picture. Put your phone in your pocket. Say yes. God bless your heart. Miss Lily Collins is my sister in Christ. It gives me great pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Next up is Mr. Davis. Come on, Mr. Davis. Now, Mr. Davis, this one was pretty special. His, his dad called me a few times and said, hey, I think, I think Davis is ready. What, what should I do? I'm not really sure. And I said, you know, a lot of times forcing, ask not force, that's a terrible word. We did not force this. Um, but, but saying, hey, if you're really serious about making a profession of faith, then come forward during the end of one of the services. And I, I encourage parents to do that. And Davis did that like three weeks ago. I think in October, November, he asked Jesus to save him, but he came forward and and talked with Dr. Myers. And so, Davis, has there been a time in your life when you've asked Jesus Christ to save you? Yes, sir. All right. There we go. Cross your arms. All right. Davis, as my brother in Christ, it gives me great pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death. Raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> Next up, we have Mr. Ryan and Mr. Jack. Here he comes. They're going to come down together. This is a father son duo, which is always fun. How are we doing, Dad? How are we doing, Mr. Jack? Mr. Jack is a sixth grader, Dad is not a sixth grader. And we're going to start with dad because I think it's important that fathers are leading the home, being the spiritual leaders that they're called to be. And 20 years ago, dad asked Jesus Christ to save him. And today he's excited to proclaim that to the church through believers baptism. So, Mr. Jack, would you scoot over just a little bit? Hey, your wife probably wants a picture. (laughs) Cross your arms for me, dad. Ryan, as my brother in Christ, it gives me great pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> Next up is Mr. Jack. Hey, stand on the side. I got to ask you a question first. 
Mr. Jack, has there been a time in your life when you've asked Jesus Christ to save you? Yes. All right, buddy. Cross your arms. Mr. Jack, as my brother in Christ, it gives me great pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Back to you, Dr. Meyer. You know, it's always a privilege to have the ordinance of baptism. And I know today that we had a son and his dad both being baptized. The dad 20 years removed uh, from his salvation experience. But let me just share something with you before I pray. There were eight individuals that were baptized on our campus today. Four of those eight were adults. Just let that soak in for a few moments. The overwhelming majority of people that we see coming to Christ obviously are children, and that is wonderful. But when you see four grown adults make a public testimony of Jesus Christ, guys, it is hard to ignore that God is up to something. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful today that we get to celebrate the testimony of one's faith. Whether that salvation took place a few weeks ago or two decades ago, God, thank you for the obedience that we've seen observed. God, that obedience that we find written in your holy word. And God, today... As we go forward in this service, Lord, as we have our hearts prepared in you to shape us for the days and the weeks ahead, God, we remember that you have worked in days past. Help us today to trust that you're going to work in days present. Lord, as we come and we worship together, remembering all you've done, God, may it give us that sure foundation of all that you desire to do. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Would you stand with me and sing?
with me please heavenly father thank you for this day and just thank you for this beautiful music and worship uh we have in this church god and just uh, just thank you for these tithes and offerings god i pray that they'll just be used to bring glory and honor to your kingdom and pray for dr myers as he brings the message god and, and us that you'll open up our hearts and just help us to be receptive to your word god and uh we just thank you for loving us and protecting us and care for us god we ask this all your name Amen.
Jesus for the resurrection. Thank you, Lord. One day we will be resurrected in Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, thank you that you have given us life and you've given us life everlasting. You've given us life here on earth, Lord Jesus. The resurrection power of Jesus Christ in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, the subject matter that we're going to deal with is actually contained in all four of the Gospels in the New Testament. But today, I'm going to encourage you to turn to two of those. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, and the Gospel of John, chapter 18. If you are a guest or visitor with us, let me welcome you to a journey, not through a respective Gospel or even the totality of the Gospels, but really focusing on what the Gospels focus on. You may or may not be aware that the gospel accounts give a very uh, inordinate amount of attention to the last week in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, in particular to the last 24 hours. 
You know, oftentimes we'll see a, a miracle or a, hear a sermon from the lips of Jesus, and it's in one of the Gospels or in some of the Gospels, but not all of the Gospels. And yet, as you walk through the last 24 hours of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, we discover that almost every single event is so important that it is in all four, and such is today. Now, we're only going to be in Luke chapter 22, in John chapter 18, but we're going to look at the event where Peter denies the Lord. And today, again, as we often have, it's not an event to be relegated uh, to the volumes of history. We're going to be looking back at what occurred that fateful evening. But remember, when we walk through the questions today, when we get to the final question, we're going to discover that what happened in Peter's life is very prophetic to what is happening in the world you and I are living in today as well. Luke chapter 22. We're going to begin in verse 54. Now let me set the stage. Judas has come and betrayed the Lord with a kiss. There have been 500 soldiers with torches and weapons. They ask if this was Jesus of Nazareth. He, he answered, yes, I am. They all fall back. They come back. They take him uh, into custody. Peter cuts off the ear of Malchus. Jesus heals his ear. The disciples go running like cockroaches in the daylight. Chaos has ensued. Verse 54. Then they took him, and they led and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. And when they kindled a fire in the midst of the hall, they were set down together, and Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire, and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a while, another saw him. It said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another, confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while yet spoke, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said unto him, Before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out, and he wept bitterly. Now, let me encourage you to turn to John chapter 18. There's a, a scenario here in the Johannine, or the Gospel of John account. It's very important to use as we compare and contrast Peter's actions and his words. Beginning in verse 15 of chapter 18, it says that Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest, but Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, spoke unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then said the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art thou not also one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. And the servants and the officers stood there, who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold. They warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them, and warmed himself. Again, one of the most famous events, not only in the entirety of Scripture, but most importantly, in these hours before the crucifixion and eventual resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we begin of, of the when. Now we can look at it chronologically. It was pretty much right at or a little after midnight. It is in the dead of the night. But more importantly, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus Christ has just been betrayed by Judas. It took 500 men although it didn't require that many, it took 500 to bring him to the captivity. They make their way to Caiaphas' house. Now, the event that we will study next is what we call the trial of Jesus and Pilate. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, this is the trial. And, and you're right, because the trial of Jesus Christ took place over a period of about eight to nine hours and involved two major phases. You've got the Jewish phase, which is what we're addressing uh, today, where he's there in front of the Sanhedrin, the high priest, and then they, at the break of dawn, uh, will turn him over to the Romans. You may remember uh, that the high priest will declare that he has spoken blasphemy. He will uh, rent his clothes in two, and next week we'll find ourselves on the front steps of Pilate's palace. But in between, there's Peter, the same man who said, Lord, no matter what happens to you, I will never forsake you. The same man, when Jesus questioned him and said, who do you say that I am? He said, you are the Christ, the Son 
of the living God. So what we're addressing today isn't a Peter problem exclusively. It can unfortunately become an all of us problem. And that's when it took place. Now let's talk about the who. Obviously we know Simon Peter. He's one of those characters in the Bible that we know pretty well. But it's this other character that I want to call your attention to. Notice in the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verse 15, it says that Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. And not only in this verse, but in the next verse, it says, because he was known unto the high priest. Now, there's really two streams of thought on who this person is. Uh, there's a group of people who believe that this is the Apostle John. Why would it be the Apostle John? Because he is the beloved disciple. He is the one who, within the, the Gospel of John, never just calls himself out and says, I'm the brother of James, the son of Zebedee. He kind of just gives us these hints, like the one who laid upon him when they were at dinner, the one who never left him. Because in John chapter 19, when Jesus Christ goes to the cross, the only one of the, quote, disciples that will be there is whom we know as the Apostle John. And so it rightfully makes sense to say, well, this John never left his side. He was the one. Here's the issue with that. And by the way, there's no problem if that's the one that you agree with. It says twice he was known to the high priest. Now, the high priest was not, in our terminology, a spiritual leader. Think in Jesus' day. The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the scribes, the high priests, they were more political power brokers than they were anything else. Why is that critical? Because the disciples were the exact antithesis of political power brokers. These were fishermen and laborers who Jesus called by the Sea of Galilee. Now, there is the possibility that he had some family connection uh, to Caiaphas. But there's another possibility. There are those that believe this was Nicodemus. Remember the man who came to Jesus by night in John chapter 3? And said, how can a man be born again? I, I don't understand what you're saying, Jesus. This same Nicodemus is the same man that in John 19, when Joseph of Arimathea is preparing the burial site, it will be Nicodemus who actually helps him lower the body and provides the means to prepare his body. And it was this same Nicodemus that in John chapter 7, the same group that's gathered here to, quote, crucify Jesus is the same group that desired to do so earlier. Nicodemus pipes up. Remember, he was one of them. He was, Jesus called him a master of Israel. This would have been his people, so to speak. And what happens there? They said, oh, we need to take this Jesus. And Nicodemus says, how can we condemn a man without hearing him out first? You remember what those guys said? Are you one of his disciples as well? And so you see kind of this process with Nicodemus. And again, whether it be John or whether it be Nicodemus, one thing we know is this. In the most intense hour of the trial of Jesus Christ... Peter's out on the porch warming his hands, and an unnamed disciple is right beside him. And then there's this group of strangers. Uh, we know that the first denial is a young lady. We know there's a man that pipes up later. But notice in the accounts that we read that Peter is outside warming himself by the fire. Notice what the Bible says. There were soldiers there. The same men that brought Jesus to Caiaphas's palace were there as well. So everything that Peter says was not an isolated conversation. This is not one of those private messages, so to speak, that they were having with each other. Everything spoken would have not only been heard by Jesus, we'll get to that in just a moment, would have been heard by those who were charged with the same instructions that if anybody else joined with Jesus's identification. But it is the where that gets me. This is the part where when you begin to kind of look at how the scene evolves, it's the where it took place. Now this is Caiaphas's house, and that may not seem significant to you, but if you've ever had the privilege of traveling to the Holy Land, if you've ever had the privilege of touring Israel and Jerusalem, you'll understand what I'm about to mean. If you have not we're beginning to kind of see things open up again. Hopefully we'll have that opportunity uh, in the days moving forward. But when you go to Israel, uh, they usually give you a tour guide. They have to give you a, a tour guide. And that tour guide's very well versed in history and in the Old Testament. But let me share with you what happens about 80 to 85% of the time. 
Now, for those of you listening on the radio, this is a visual, so I apologize, okay? Typically, you go to a site, everybody gets off the bus, and at some point, the tour guide will say, on my right hand is where many people believe this event took place. On my left hand is where other people believe this event took place. Behind me, there's another group that thinks that's where it took place. We don't exactly know where, but it was somewhere around here. That's the tour. And I can give you an absolute guarantee when you go to a specific place, if they built a church on that site, that is exactly where it did not happen. Okay, so nonetheless, everything's very generalized, except in this case. See, when we talk about Caiaphas's palace, there's only one building that matches the description. It's on the south side of the Temple Mount. If and when you visit it, you will discover that below where the servants met was where they would bring the prisoners. There was a dungeon, for a lack of better terms, and I've been there, I've seen it with my own eyes, I've touched it with my own hands, where they would lower a rope to be put around the one who was being indicted, and they would bring him up into the center of these men who would determine the said individual's fate. But that's not the part that's most important. It's where Peter was. Notice what it says, he was on the outside. In fact, the Gospel of Mark says he was on the porch. I've been on that porch. And, and I've seen where Peter would have stood. And, and I've seen where Jesus would have had to have been. Because this is the only place that it could happen. You say, why is that so significant? Because we read stories about Peter denying. And the Gospel of Mark says he was cursing and using foul language. And we oftentimes think somewhere across the way, maybe around the bend. But if you were to go to that porch today and stand where Peter stood and see where Jesus had to be, it's no more than about 10 yards. That's it. You know what you can do within 10 yards? You can look in people's eyes. Notice it says at the end of the passage, and Jesus looked upon him. This isn't an account of on the other side. This didn't happen in isolation. In fact, Jesus and Peter were in such close proximity, they could have a conversation without ever saying a word. So let's lead to the what. What happens? Back to Luke chapter 22. I want you to first see that there's a very distinct pattern in Peter's life, a lesson for each and every one of us. Verse 54 Notice where Peter is. It says he followed Jesus. How? There's a description. Afar off. There's distance between him and Jesus. Then you get to verse 57. He denies him. You get to verse 62 and it says, and he went out and he wept bitterly. Now when the Bible says he wept bitterly, I don't know if you've ever had one of those times in life where you're so emotional, you're so, quote, wrung out, you can't even stand up. You know, in my life, I have the opportunity on numerous occasions to have people weep bitterly in front of me. You say, why is that? Because when your life is falling apart and things have gone sideways, rarely if ever do you call the pastor first. We're usually the last one you call. Everything is out of sorts. Everything is out of order. The emotions have been building. And all of a sudden, you sit down in front of me with a box of Kleenexes and it's over. And you just weep. I see it on a regular basis. You say, why is that so important? You know what I've never heard come out of anybody's mouth? I've never heard somebody wrapped up in sin. I've never heard somebody whose life is completely sideways say, Pastor, I don't know how this happened. I'm in Bible study every day. I pray all the time. I never miss church. How is my life so upside down? You know what people usually say to me? I should have seen this coming. How does he begin? Afar off. See, there's a pattern here. When we begin to allow distance between us and Jesus, denial starts happening. Weeping starts happening. Let me make it a little more relevant. Did you know that Peter woke up that morning and he did not say, today, I'm denying Jesus. He didn't do it. Nobody wakes up and says, today, I become a drunk. 
No. It's progressive, isn't it? And it always starts with having distance between you and the Lord. And the pattern is, lest we learn from him where we can end up just like him. But it's also a picture. It's a picture of what sin looks like in our life. I mean, he's fallen afar off, and for whatever reason, it seems somewhat benign at first until the young lady comes up. And then the man arrives, and according to the other Gospels, he starts using foul language. Let me give you an old adage about sin. You may have heard this, but if not, you need to. Okay? Sin will take you further than you ever want to go. It will cost you more than you ever want to pay, and it will keep you longer than you ever want to stay. And that's exactly what sin does in our life. Peter did not design this. He did not want this. This was not what he had hoped for his life when he woke up that morning, much less the three years walking with Jesus. But it happened when he was distanced from, he was afar. And it's a picture to us of what happens when we allow sin to seep in our lives being unaddressed. If we do not address it, it incrementally, progressively will take us to a place where we never intended to be. Hear me clearly. Peter never wanted to be here. And when people sit across from me with their lives in shreds, I've never had anybody say, man, this is exactly how I wanted it to be. It's a picture. But it's also very prophetic. You say, well, how's it prophetic? You understand that in this story, Jesus is on trial. He is on trial at such a level that they cannot find an accusation that will stick. In fact, if you read the other gospel accounts, here's what we discover. That they so desperately wanted to incriminate him that they actually made up lies, got two people to agree to lie so that technically he could be charged with what they wanted to charge him with and sent to the Romans. Why is this prophetic today? Because if you haven't realized it or not, Biblical Christianity is on trial. You know, it's interesting what we're accused of. It's much like Jesus. See, Jesus was not found guilty of anything he was actually guilty of. He was found guilty of something he had nothing to do with. Allow me to put it in today's terminology. Can I share with you what biblical Christianity is really guilty of? I'll tell you. We are guilty of providing hospitals for people who are sick, who can't pay for it, so we take care of the bill. We're guilty of that. Did you know we're guilty that when hurricanes and tornadoes show up, we give of our own money and we send people to help and we never send an invoice. Guilty. So what has the world done? You know what the world has done? We can't charge them based on what they've actually done because that's beneficial. So let's make up a lie. They hurt our feelings. Mm. Oh, we went there. Because that's the charge that the world is presenting, is it not? Those Christians, they don't see me the way I see me. They hurt my feelings. Jesus was not even guilty of what they charged him with. And yet you and I today... We're facing the same trial. You know what the Bible says in the last days, 2 Thessalonians 2? There's going to be a great falling away. In the last days, as we get closer to Jesus' return, there's going to be a whole lot more, quote, Peter show up. You say, what do you mean? As Christianity comes under fire, as it's being accused of things it's not even guilty of, you've got people out on the porch going, I don't know who they are. I don't want to have anything to do with them. Let me give you some information. Did you know it's not the lost world that is harming, quote, unquote, biblical Christianity? It's those who claim to be Christians who are staying silent or cussing us out because we won't forsake what is true. That's the world we're living in today. It's not just a picture. It's prophetic. So why is this relevant? How does this play out? Well, go back to verse 52 or 54. I want you to notice the pattern again, afar off. And I want you to ask yourself a very important question. Now today, either in person or online, I may be preaching to the proverbial choir, but how's your distance with Jesus? Where are you? 
Because one of the things that our culture provides us so easily that is so attractive is that I can always attend that Bible study. I can never do this event. I can always have access to whatever it may be. And what happens is we, we fall in this trap of distancing ourselves, saying it's not that critical, it's not that important. And you and I need to do a very important self-examination of ourselves and say, are we distanced or are we right where Jesus is? But it's also a picture for us of what compromise looks like. You say compromise, let me give you a definition of what it means to compromise. Compromise is when you trade an eternal truth for a temporary pleasure or blessing. Is that not what Peter did? He said, I'm not going to identify with Jesus because I want to save my hide. Literally. People thought ill of him. They began to question him. Are you not one of them? And how many of us today literally deny the Lord so that people will not think ill of us? Or that possibly uh, we will not have some type of economic or physical detriment. Now let me put those two together for just a moment. Notice he follows so far off and he compromises. Is that not how it works in our world today? Those of you that either A, are employed by somebody else or you employ others, can I give you an adage? It's somewhat humorous, but it's real. When the cat is away, oh, the mice do play. Guys, those of you that play sports, young people, how do you act at practice when the coach is right next to you versus when he's in the field house? It's a big difference, right? In other words, it's real easy for us to look at Peter and go, man, I can't believe he did what he did. But when we allow ourselves not only to grow distant from the Lord, but to no longer have the supervision we need, we start compromising. We don't run the laps we're supposed to run. We don't do the reports we're supposed to do. That's exactly what happened because he was a far off. And then finally, the prophetic. I mentioned earlier, very importantly, that when Peter stood on that porch, it might have been about a 10-yard difference, enough to where they could see eyeball to eyeball. You know, we talk a lot about it because the Bible supports it. Do you know there's more passages in the Bible about the second coming of Christ than the first coming? And the Bible warns us not to set dates. I understand. The Bible warns us about marking calendars and saying this is when it's going to happen. So let me give you the Myers Guide to predicting when Jesus is going to come back. You ready? We're closer today than we were yesterday. There you go. That's it. And if tomorrow comes, we're closer then. But if you look at the Bible just through rudimentary prophetic lenses, I've been on planet Earth for almost half a century. And I can promise you, we are closer to his return today than we were 50 years ago. In fact, you look back 10 years ago, 10 days ago. Why is that important? If you will allow me the analogy, if you will allow me the visual, you and I are 2,000 years this side of the empty tomb. We have the privilege of not only seeing what took place, how humanity has responded, but we're seeing what the Bible says about the, quote, end times being played out before our very eyes. And so visually, just work with the analogy, Jesus is closer to us than he was in days past. Now, I know he comes in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, I get all that, but work with the analogy. So if Jesus is as close to us now as he's ever been might it be he's about 10 yards away see in days past the church had the privilege of saying "Woo, it's a long ways off we'll just do what we want to do nowadays we don't have that privilege i'm gonna be honest it wouldn't surprise me one bit if we didn't make the evening service tonight because they called us home wouldn't shock me at all So per the analogy, he's about 10 yards away, which means that when we pull a Peter, we're looking at him eyeball to eyeball, saying, I know you're about to step foot out of the heavens, but I'm going to do it anyway. See, Peter is a picture prophetically of us. See, today we have a decision to make. 
There are two individuals in this passage. One on the porch, cursing, yelling, and denying. And one on the inside, right where Jesus is. Unless you question what happened to him, there is one thing we know for certain. He did not end up being crucified with Jesus because the two men on the side of Jesus were two thieves, not this man. Peter's greatest fears weren't even realized by the one who was on the inside. So today, we got a decision to make. Are we going to keep our distance for self-preservation? Are we going to, quote, get in the proverbial fire with the Lord? Because the safest place in the world is right where Jesus is. Let's pray with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. And maybe today, as we hear the challenge about Peter and this other disciple, maybe you're on person here, maybe you're online, maybe you're listening on the radio, but maybe the Spirit of God took the Word of God and it really pierced your heart. And today's not necessarily about being a far away. Maybe today you said, you know, I, I'm not even a believer, but man, now I understand how important it is. You know, the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And maybe you're that person today. You know, when the Bible says call on the name of the Lord to be saved, it doesn't mean to pass a test. It doesn't mean to jump through a hoop. It doesn't mean to check off a box. It means just to confess that you're a sinner in need of saving. And maybe today you're that person. Let me encourage you. It's not about the prescription of words that you say. It's about the intent of your heart. Maybe today your conversation with the Lord would go something like this. God, I recognize that I have sinned. God, I have messed up. I've been in the wrong places with the wrong people, doing the wrong things with the wrong attitude. God, I understand that the wages, the result of my sin, according to your Bible, is death. But I also understand that verse says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Today, God, I believe. I believe I got a sin problem that only Jesus can solve. God, I believe that Jesus Christ loved me so much. He was willing to be born on my behalf. He was willing to live a sinless life on my behalf. He was willing to pay the price of my sin on his cross. And God, I believe that when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he made it feasible, he made it possible for my sin to be forgiven and my soul to be saved. God, today, I don't have all the answers to the issues, the struggles, and the problems of this old world. But there's one thing I do know. I got a sin problem. That nothing and nobody can solve but Jesus. The best way I know, I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking you to save me. I just want to turn my life over to you. With our heads still bowed, our eyes still closed. Maybe you're that person today who had that conversation with the Lord. Like we've seen in other services. Just encourage you in a moment as I pray when we stand just to step out and step forward. Or maybe today you're like one of those eight individuals that went through the baptism waters. You're already a believer. You just need to testify to the world at large. Or maybe you're like the many families today. Said, you know what? We're saved. We're baptized. We just want this to be our, our home, our faith home. We encourage you today. We're here for you. We love the privilege of celebrating with you and praying with and for you. Heavenly Father, as we come to this time of decision, God, thank you that as we began this service, you are a God of amazing grace. We don't deserve to be forgiven. We don't deserve to be saved. We do not deserve to be in a right relationship with you. But God, you've offered it because of your great love for us. May we, as we close the service, may we make that decision for you and you alone. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. If you would stand with me as Bruce leads us, whatever decision, we'll be right here at the front. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me.
the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Church family, if you'll be seated for just a moment, that third verse of that song, it gets me every time, but particularly in light of today's text. You know, that disciple whose name we know not of, no one else was willing to go with him. But he did anyway. What a challenge to each and every one of us. Even if none go with us, we will fall. With the opportunity to be prayed with, prayed for, uh, to render whatever decision may be necessary in your life has actually not come to a close. Uh, In a moment, Dr. Spargo is going to come and give our benediction. And afterwards, you're going to see some folks pretty easily identifiable to my right, your left. We still have a room set aside. We have a team set aside. And like I said, we have had dozens of individuals back there. I don't know what all the decisions are. All I know is this. We're here for you, uh, whatever it may be. Tonight at 6 o'clock, regularly scheduled Sunday evening services, whether it be in here, student ministry, kids' choir, everything is as uh, we expect it. Uh, We're going to have just a brief video just to kind of give you some highlights of some ministry opportunities. Please hear me clearly. What you're about to see is not all that's happening. Please go to our app or the website for all of the ministry opportunities. These are just some time-sensitive things we want you to be aware of. And then Dr. Paul Spargo is going to close us. Watch this quick video. Hey, First Baptist, my name's Megan, and thanks so much for being here today. Student ministry, girls, this Saturday, February 26th, is for you. We have a high school girls brunch. We will do floral arrangements, have a cookie decorating class in the well from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. We will have a Bible study led by Miss Ann Hillier and a panel of women answering questions that have been submitted. This brunch is for all 9th through 12th grade girls and will be $15 at the door on Saturday. Registration is open until Wednesday at fpcostudents.com. Middle School Girls, your event is Saturday night. Join us in the well from 6 to 9 p.m. for pizza, popcorn, games, and a movie. Wear your favorite PJs and come ready to hang out. This event is for 7th and 8th grade girls. $5 at the door Saturday night. Registration is open until Wednesday at fbcostudents.com. Young Adults, save the date for Tuesday, March 1st. For more info and updates, follow us on our Instagram at fbcoyoungadults or on our website. Join us as we host the Collingsworth family on their Just Sing tour on Sunday, March 13th at 6 p.m. in the Worship Center. This will be a free concert. Christian comedian Tim Hawkins is back at FPCO Sunday, March 27th at 7 p.m. in the Worship Center. Tickets are available at fpcofalaika.com slash events. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week. Go to our website at fpcofalaika.com and on all social platforms. Join us tonight in the Worship Center at 6 p.m. for evening service. Have a great afternoon. If you're interested in attending the Tim Hawkins event, we do have some tickets that are available for purchase at the Welcome Center, so please take advantage of that. On every Tuesday morning, we have a a pastoral staff meeting where we all get together with the pastor. We talk about uh, issues, problems, victories, what's going on. And uh, the pastor always talks about the guests And he has an amazing memory to remember all of the guests, their names, where they were from. And uh, that's a blessing to him. Bless the pastor today. If this is your first time here, maybe your first time in a long time, if you'll exit the auditorium to your left, visit the pastor in the parlor, share a cup of coffee with him. He has a gift for you. It'll be a blessing to him and encouragement to him. Let's all stand, shall we, as we're dismissed. Looks like we're going to have a lovely day today. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We pray, Lord, that we might be doers of your word and not just hearers only. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 